Be The Best You Podcast. The sole purpose of this podcast is to teach, inspire, and motivate everyone to be the best versions of themselves. Welcome to another episode of the Be The Best You Podcast. I'm your host, Larry Dawson, and today I got a real treat for you guys. I have my wife, Jessica Dawson, on here as a guest today. I promise I'll throw some curveballs at her. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey, baby. Hi. You ready to answer some questions? So excited. You want me to just throw you right into the deep end? Just toss me one in there. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got. What are the best foods, supplements, and exercises people can do for brain health? So I started studying brain health, like, Oh, a couple years ago when I was suffering personally from brain fog and being able to articulate myself I would find myself in meetings them asking me a question and needing them to jog my memory so my focus when I was looking into brain health was trying to figure out exactly how the brain functions so that I can figure out how exactly I could uh, fix what was going on. So the brain is mostly made of water. So a big component of brain health is being able to be hydrated. Um, secondly is the mitochondria in the brain. It's how the brain functions. It's how it communicates with the rest of the body. So the mitochondria, if we're a computer, the mitochondria is like the motherboard. So it doesn't matter how pretty the computer is. It doesn't matter you know, what you download on it. If the motherboard isn't working properly, your brain's not working properly, and by default, the rest of your body isn't gonna be working properly. So the mitochondria functions by either utilizing sugar or fat for energy. It has been shown in clinical studies that a high glycemic diet, which is high in sugar, ultra processed foods, actually slows down the mitochondria and doesn't allow your body to function properly. It functions best with fat, healthy fat. Um, and so with that being said, the best foods for the brain would be anything that's high in omega-3s and omega-6s, which would be fishes, fish oils, fish eggs, not the supplement fish oil. Fish oil, the supplement actually has a very short shelf life. And if you buy it, odds are it's likely rancid. So the best form would be to get it in the form of fish or fish eggs. Um, you can do chia seeds, you can do avocados. Um, extra virgin olive oil. We use MCT oil every day in our coffee. We do. Um, MCT oil is really cool because it doesn't have to be digested. It's one of the things that bypasses the blood brain barrier and it allows the brain to use it immediately as fuel. I used to take a shot of MCT oil before I would go on like my 10 mile runs because I felt like it was better than a pre workout and I knew that it would afford me the energy that I needed to go throughout the run. Um, I wouldn't recommend taking a shot of MCT oil if you're not used to it because it is tough on the stomach and you will end up sprinting back to use the bathroom. So <laughs> I would not do that. Um, as far as supplements are concerned, another thing I put in our coffee in the morning are the adaptogens or the medicinal mushrooms, not to be confused by psychedelic mushrooms. The medicinal mushrooms are like lion's mane, reishi, chaga, cordyceps. Um, there's also a line of nootropics out there by um, Onnit. Alpha Brain is one that we use regularly. But um, as far as supplements are concerned, I would definitely say magic, not magic, yeah, medicinal mushrooms, not magic mushrooms. And um, exercise, was that another one you said? Yeah, what exercises would help with that? Or exercise in itself, period. Exercise in itself is really good. Um, specifically for Parkinson's, if you want to, um, it's been shown to lessen the symptoms or to slow the progression of Parkinson's boxing mm -hmm. because of the hand-eye coordination and being able to like cross over and track. That's actually been known to be really good for people that have Parkinson's and kind of really combat it. Um, the interesting thing about the brain is that um, it's very tied to gut health and the microbiome and the brain communicate with each other. 50% of the body's serotonin and dopamine is created in the gut. 
So if you're not eating a healthy diet, you will not be able to have a healthy brain or healthy brain function. And there was a clinical study that they did recently. It was a blind test where they just took the microbiome, they took the, a sample of the gut, and they could tell just by looking at the bacteria in the gut whether somebody had schizophrenia or whether they had depression. And they were able to see a lot of that has to do with the sugar and the ultra-processed food that we're putting in our diets these days. And they took it a step further and they looked at, um, they, they did a transplant. They took somebody that actually had um, schizophrenia and somebody that was normal and they transplanted their microbiome into their stomach and their symptoms started to lessen and then they did the reverse for mice where they took seemingly help with healthy mice and took the microbiome of an unhealthy person with schizophrenia put it in the mouse and they started to exhibit signs of um, schizophrenia so overall gut health and eating whole healthy foods um, is really what's best for the brain an exercise period what, what is it, if you exercise at least 15 minutes a day, the way the brain and the body reacts. Um, what, so people for years have been coming to me for training, obviously, me being in the fitness industry, and they'll, they'll tell me a lot of different things they have going on, whether it's you know them being lazy, um, them not wanting to work out, them gaining weight, uh, their moods, uh, their sleep patterns, depression, headaches, um, even like common colds, getting sick quite a bit, um, depression, all these things, right? And I'll tell people like, a lot of the stuff that you're experiencing <clears throat> has to do with your lack of exercise, yeah. your lack of hydration, the foods that you're putting in your body, these yeah. processed foods and stuff like that. And I almost get an eye roll to a certain extent because I don't think people understand that we are made up of the food and the liquid that we put in our body. Absolutely. So our heart health, our brain health, our overall health is all controlled off of that. And, and when I say stuff like when people tell me they're getting migraines or people tell me they're lazy or tell, you know, depressed or they have these things going on, and I, and I mentioned food and water intake and stuff like that and exercise to them, they're looking at me like, okay, you're saying that because you're healthy and that's your lifestyle. So, no, no, these are facts. These are proven 100% facts. The problem is, is that if you do the research and you understand that these things are true and these are facts, then that means that you can't just blame your headache on work. Right. You have to actually take responsibility and say, well, I'm dehydrated. What I need to I need to force myself to drink eight bottles of water a yeah. day. So you almost put the onus on yourself to have to step up to the plate. But as long as you deny it and you don't pay attention to it, you can blame being depressed on something. You can blame having a headache on something. You can blame being lazy on something. Or you can blame gaining weight on something. But if you actually do research and put time and effort in and see like, all these things are affected by the food I'm putting in my body, the liquid I'm putting in my body, the lack of exercise or the exercise that I'm giving my body, and that's why I'm having these reactions. Uh, that's why I wanted to ask you the question about the brain because so many times people will come to me and they'll tell me they're stressed out or they have migraines or they're tired or they don't feel like doing something or just talking with them and dealing with them. I can see the frustration. I can see like where they're at with things. And I'll tell them that part of that issue is what they're putting in their body and they, 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 they just no, want to hear it. actually to take what you just said a step further is obviously what you put in your body is very important and it creates the bacteria in your stomach, both good and bad. And when you have the bad bacteria in your stomach, that bad bacteria, it wants to live, it wants to grow, it wants to survive. So it's going to have you crave those things that's going to help it survive. But a byproduct of eating that and feeding it is that the good bacteria is not going to be doing as well. And so if you're eating a high sugar diet and if you aren't doing a lot of movement, the bacteria in your gut is going to crave a high sugar diet and not a lot of movement. I think a lot of people don't realize that and it's sad because is why a lot of people can't stay on diets. They don't want to eat the cupcake. But chemically, like bio biologically, their stomach is telling their brain to crave it. And we have a hormone in our stomach called ghrelin, where once we habitually do something on a regular basis, 
the ghrelin starts to remind us, oh, you need this, you're hungry. So if you're used to eating a cookie every night at 9.30, at 9.30, your stomach's gonna start saying, I want that cookie. And it is, these are living organisms inside of you that are trying to, just like when you have a virus, it's a living organism inside of you. So a lot of those people roll their eyes at you and it's hard to do because they have the bacteria in their body that is telling them to do otherwise. But it is empowering to know that you can change your microbiome and you can start to change it in as little as three days. For me, I think it's helpful to know, like when you have a craving of sugar, to know that it's the bad bacteria in your gut that's craving it and maybe it reframes it into, all right, I don't want to feed that. I want to feed myself something better. Yeah, I always tell everybody the hardest step with anything you do in life is the first step. Yeah. Because you've actually taken the step. Because we all talk about, think about it, blah, 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 blah. But to actually make the move to do something, regardless of what it is, take that first step is the hardest step. But most people, you know, man, they get in that zone and they just, they just don't want to take that step. Um, I don't think that people understand that a lot of the food that we eat these days does not have in it what we actually need to survive. And that's why me and you take a lot of supplements. Because most of the food in America, like, America is known for having processed food, sugar foods, fat foods. So when this stuff's being pushed at you, you have two choices. You can either be completely against what society's telling you and, you know, fish and chicken and vegetables and eat like that, but you also need to take supplements. And that's why me and you take so many supplements to, to give our bodies the things that the food is lacking in America. And, and you touched on sugar. What I wanted to say about sugar is that people don't understand this. Sugar is more addictive than heroin. So like, okay, we, yeah. so we have this mindset the drugs are bad, and drugs are bad. I'm not trying to say they're not, but it's crazy. Like when our government can find ways to regulate and make money's money off of things, and so it's sold like it's okay, but in reality, how bad it is for you. But because it's regulated and they found a way to regulate and make money off of it, now it's okay. Whereas sugar is more addictive than heroin, where alcohol is more addictive than you know, almost any drug out there where these prescription medications are brutal. It's the number one um, epidemic in our country is the opioid epidemic. But they found ways to regulate these things and make money off of these things. So people are just pounding sugar at such a rate and it's literally killing you. That's not an exaggeration. It's literally killing you yeah, from the inside lives. out. Yeah. It's interesting because the food companies, obviously they wanna make money. So they're not worried about your health. They're worried about their food being addictive and they're worried about it not satisfying you because they want you to keep coming back for more. So there's actually big food companies that will put electrodes on your brain and they'll let you taste their food. And they'll be able to see how the brain lights up and how you'll get like an explosion of dopamine. And the thing about dopamine, when you're eating whole foods, when you uh, eat a whole food dopamine, it's like a spray. But when you're eating these ultra processed foods, it's like an explosion. And when you take it, it dissipates very quickly. And then you become almost like addicted to the next hit of dopamine, which kind of snowballs in our society because you can get dopamine from a variety of things. Exercise being one of them, but also things like likes or addictions like gambling, social media, like all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, they're smart. They know what they're doing. And Pepsi gets, I think I heard 10% of its revenue from um, government programs, like from the food programs, as far as their beverages. You know, a couple of people we know, like Alex and Sheldon and stuff that have went overseas recently and spent time over there, both came back and lost a lot of weight. Yeah. Because they don't have all those sugary foods right. over there and all the processed foods over there. Then you come over here and 60% of America is obese and you wonder why 60% of America is obese. Yeah. Any store you go in to check out, as soon as you check out, what do you see? You see impulse buys all around you, sugary fat stuff. Uh, so it's just it's just an avalanche on you all the time. So you have to be disciplined and you have to understand these things so you don't fall in the traps that they set for you. When you're healthy, though, you don't necessarily crave those things. No, you don't. Um, it's it's when you're, you're used to having. Well, yeah, it's when you're used to having it that you start to crave it. Mm -hmm. But like 
you and I have both done this where we've removed sugar and then you look at a donut and it almost makes your stomach hurt. Yeah. But I've not removed sugar. I've been like, oh, I could really use a donut right now. So I understand both sides of it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a dangerous cycle to get stuck on. Yeah. Um, so if you guys are watching or listening to this video today, please make sure you take the time to like, subscribe, share, comment. Without you guys' the support, this wouldn't be possible, and we appreciate everyone that's been supporting this podcast so far. All right, so I got a couple more questions here. We're gonna we're gonna flip things around, and we're gonna ask you uh, a lot of different things. The well, second the second question I have for you is: What's the difference between working in the corporate world and working for yourself as a business owner? And so, so the question on itself surface level is a good question but you you have your hands in both obviously you know you're pretty high up in corporate world and you've been there for a while and you know over the last you know year or two you've uh, branched out into being a business owner and doing your own thing what is like you know your opinion on the two different and what advice would you give to other people that are watching that are thinking about going to one or the other and just just give us just give us Jessica's opinion on it um well if I'm being completely transparent I um I operate in a comfort zone so I would not have gone out and been a business owner if it weren't for you pushing me which is good it's good to have people like that in your life um I love my corporate job I feel very lucky and I've always had a lot of flexibility with it even before COVID. I was a telecommuter, I worked from home, I had flexible hours, I had great pay, I had benefits. So I felt really lucky and it's not what I thought working in the corporate world was in my mind, but it ended up being so much better. Um, when it comes to being a business owner, you know, it's the obvious, you have the autonomy to make your own schedule and to be able to do whatever you want. Um, there's a fear aspect there though. Like you, like you have to produce, you have to do well, where I know in my corporate world, I'm going to get paid whether they do well or not, whether they make a sale or not, my salary is guaranteed. Um, but I do think about every time somebody asks about, um, owning like a business or whatever, I think about that song by Dirty Heads, the, <laughs> the I'm on my vacation, oh, my vacation every single day. Cause I love my <laughs> occupation. Yeah. It's cool to be able to break away because we can work from the beach and we can, you know, do a lot of that stuff. So, but in my corporate job, I just have the ability to do the same. I can work from the beach as well. So I don't think I have a traditional corporate nine to five where you go in and like, I can, we can go anywhere in the world and I can bring my laptop with me. So I feel blessed for that. I want you to continue to elaborate on this a little bit more, but one thing I want to step in and say is that you are really blessed, but you're really talented and really smart as well. And your experience in the corporate world is a lot different than other people's is because, you know, so as your husband, it sits back. Sometimes when you're in the storm, as people, we can't see things. But then when we have someone that's not in the storm, that's just kind of sitting there watching, we can see things that the person in the storm can't. And you know, you'll do that for me as well. And this is a conversation, I haven't even actually said this to you, so this is the first time you've heard me say this, is that you, really work hard at having a positive mindset and being a positive person. So you don't, you try to rebuke negative in any, in, in any type of way. So where a lot of people get stuck in their, in, in ruts at their job and complain about their jobs and, and, and bitch about things and worry about pay and, and work drama stuff, you don't get into any of that. You don't get into any work drama. You don't do any complaining. You don't get into that pay game. You don't get into this person's doing this and stuff. You go to work with a positive attitude, and you're really smart, and you do a really good job. And because of that, people like that and respect that about you, so they deal with you appropriately because of that. So your work experience starts with you being positive and the energy you put out and then that coming back on you. And that has helped you. I've watched you over the last, we'll just use since we bought this particular house. We've been in this house for three years now. I've watched you get three promotions in the last three years. And you know, keep climbing and keep climbing, and everybody likes you and respects you, and, and, and you've become a go-to person if anybody needs anything. Uh, so I think a lot of your experience in the corporate world is is based off of who you have become as a human being. Yeah. And, and so 
that is going to carry you far in the corporate world, but also in the business world or anything. I've watched the evolution of you as a wife, as a mother, as an entrepreneur, as a person, as a friend. So you have really hit your stride where like you're shining in every single area. Um, but you take that, take, I wanted to get that out there and say that, but you know, if someone's out there and they're watching or listening to this video and they're thinking, I don't like my corporate job, <laughs> that's not my experience. And they're thinking about stepping away to open their own business or, or be an entrepreneur or do something different. What piece of advice would you give them? What, if you could talk to them for a minute and tell them something? I think that you just have to have faith and you have to have trust in, in the plan that you have created. Um, that, that's the best, because for me, the thought of me stepping away from my corporate job, which provides a very comfortable life, and to step into the unknown is very scary. So the only advice that I could give is maybe something that would be hard for me to, to do on an action basis. It's just simply take that leap of faith and have trust that that is your mission and that is your purpose. Um, I think that when you're doing something and you're aligned with what your purpose is, everything comes. Like you said, it's the energy that you put out there, you get it back. So you just kind of have to go in and let go of all of the, anything that would be holding you back. Fear. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or any kind of doubt, any of the what ifs, because you can what if yourself to death in any situation. Sometimes you just have to let go and just say, everything's going to happen the way that it should. Even if I go out on this limb and I try this opportunity and it doesn't work and I left my job, something is going to cross my path that was meant to that it wouldn't have otherwise had I not taken this course of action. There's a quote that I love and it is, um, obstacles are detours in the right direction. So even though sometimes you might make a move that doesn't turn out to be at all what you envisioned, something else might come into your path as a result of that move that makes it so much better and puts you on your path of what you should be on. One, one thing that I used to my advantage uh, for anyone that is watching or listening that maybe would be a good idea for them to implement, and shout out to Bambino who's behind the camera filming us. I actually heard him mention this recently and I said to myself when I heard him mention it, that's really smart because I actually been implementing that since I first came home. And when I first came home, obviously I didn't have anything, so I was having to do both. And I was like working one job, like corporate style, one job freelance style, and like another job kind of construction style. But I was doing all three saving paychecks to, to, to build my own. And then I ended up getting promoted more uh, on the business end but then still doing my own thing. So what I did was I killed this idea in my head that if I can make this certain amount of money that would match if I worked all these hours for someone else, this is what my salary would be for the year and this is what I could sustain living on and this would be okay. So I set that as the bottom standard as an entrepreneur. So let's just make up mythical numbers because you know like our personal business is our personal business. So let's just say from, you know, uh, uh, a fake analogy standpoint that that number was a hundred thousand right so if I said to myself if I go and I bust my butt for this company and I can make a hundred thousand dollars a year then I should be able to do that on my own and if I can do that on my own then the justification of doing it on my own is okay because I'm working for myself doing something for myself and not for someone else and I'm still making that same hundred thousand dollars but that on a personal level I put is the bottom tier of what I would want so that means if I'm making 50, I'm failing. I can't do it. I need to go back to the corporate world. But if I'm making 100, I'm okay. But that's the bottom I can make. So if I'm making 150, it's gravy on top. If I'm making 200, it's gravy on top. If I'm making 250, it's gravy on top. Because I set my bottom at 100. So as long as I'm making 100, I'm meeting where I need to be. And everything after that is golden. And then like obviously when you start to do that and you start to make money, then you say to yourself, all right, well, I'm averaging 150. Next year, I'm average two. Next year, I'm average 250. Yeah. 
So that's just a piece of advice. You know, everyone has different strategies of how they're going to become successful as a business owner or entrepreneur. So just come up with your own strategies. That's one that I use, and that's one that I heard Bambino say that as long as he could match his salary where he was at before, he was going to continue to do his own thing. So obviously, I'm not the only person that thinks like that. So uh, shout out to Bambino. That's, that, that's a, a good skill set and a good mindset. All right, so we're going to switch back up again. Let's see what we have here for you. What is something about you that most people don't know? Um, I think because I have a bubbly personality, people assume that I'm an extrovert. Um, I'm not. I'm an introvert. And I feel like uh, introverts get a really bad name <laughs> for some reason. Because it's almost like people assume that introverts are like shy or socially awkward. But that's not the case. I just I find being around large groups of people extremely draining of <laughs> my energy. Uh, but some people ex that are extroverts, they'll go out for a night out and they'll ha have a great time with friends and they'll come home and they'll feel enlivened. That's not me. I, I would rather not. <laughs> so I think because of the type of personality that I have that, I mean, you've told people before, like, I'm an, I'm an introvert. And they'll be like, what? She's so nice, though. And it's like, introverts aren't mean. <laughs> <laughs> I've had to tell them that, too. <laughs> <laughs> they just prefer to, you know, not be around large groups of people. And I, I don't have, like social anxiety or anything like that. I'm totally like fine to bring out in public. I just find it exhausting. <laughs> um, so I actually thought about this question and I thought to myself when I was gonna ask you this question, what do I think it is? And I think I already know what you think it is. What, what do you think? No, 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 what do you think? <laughs> I think that you're gonna say that I read a lot and I, well, reading is part of what makes you what I'm getting ready to say. I think the thing that most people don't understand about you is how smart you are. I think because you're an introvert or because, you know, your bubbly personality, I thought to myself, the one thing that I noticed about you from day one, and it's only gotten way stronger as time has gone on because of how much you've developed and how much you've grown, is that people don't really know you for who you are. And, I, and what I mean by that is like, I noticed after being around you the first couple years, people's perception of you versus who you really are were two completely different things. But we also live in a very surface level world, microwave society, where you know people just, they judge a book by its cover. And they don't actually dig in and look beneath the surface to really get to know someone. So I noticed very quickly within the first couple of years, like who she really is versus how people view her is completely different. And then uh, I would say over the last three to four years, your growth and evolution has been so much that the people that are extremely close to you have no idea how smart you are or how much you've grown. So when I say this right here, I mean this in a respectful way, not a disrespectful way, not even your family. And and why and when I say that is this is probably the case with a lot of families. I just don't talk a lot on what I know. I participate at a base level. And, and that's what I was getting ready to get into. And that's probably the case with most families. Because you what do you what, what do most families get together? You get together for especially bigger families, like yeah. holidays and stuff like that. You don't so, talk about the brain. So <laughs> so you you know, you talk about like the kids or you're joking around or the foods you're gonna eat or Past that, so. experiences. Yeah. So they're not digging in, getting to know who you are in the moment. And that's not just a Jessica case. We could go around the entire country and that's probably on a big majority of families. And I would say that if I had to pick one person in your family that probably does know, it's your dad. My dad actually got me, he doesn't even know. He actually got me started on a journey a long time ago. In 2016, he sent my sisters and I this book called The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. And it was a pretty book. It's right there on the bookshelf. And it sat on my coffee table for three years. <laughs> so one day I was just unsatisfied with my life and I just thought, huh, let me read this book. And that kind of started because it really talked about kind of surrendering to life and like a different aspect of spirituality. And then I read his sequel, The Surrender Experiment, and then it just snowballed into like The Secret and Joe Dispenza and all that. Um, so yeah, 
ironically, that's how everything started. Well, your dad is not a surface level person at all. Your dad is very... He's an engineer. He's very methodical. Yeah, he's very deep and he, he's very intelligent. He's very observant. That's why I said if there's one person that has noticed and does realize these things about you, it's your father because he's very, very in tune where we... We could, let's just say we go up there and your entire family's there and we hang out for an entire weekend and everyone else just sees Jesse, Jesse, Jesse. Your dad's the one out of everybody that would sit back and like notice every change, how great you're doing, where yeah, you're going. Yeah, he like, would notice the spirituality side. My mom and I share a lot about podcasts, health and wellness podcasts. Um, but yeah, I, I just, like you said, when we get together for family gatherings or regardless, even when we're out with friends, you just you talk at a surface level when you're yeah and that's why that came to my mind is because sometimes I catch uh, your dealings with people or the way people perceive you or deal with you and I'm like they don't and I'm not talking about your family I'm talking about people period when I say this I'm like man they don't really know Jess like that like she's with, like they're because people try to have conversations like I me and you talk about this. I you tell me that I should show my personality more because I tell you this that I walk around a lot and I dumb myself down to be able to communicate with people because if you speak at a very high intellectual level with people, you're going to lose them. They're going to tune you out and they're just it's just not the way our society's wired these days. No, it's partially though selecting your circle too. It, yeah, but you know when, you can do that with like friends, but you can't do that with everybody. And you'll and you'll tell me, like Larry, you should let your personality out more. Uh, so, but people, so people see you know a book by its cover. People will judge me because of tattoos or muscles or a, a curse word. It's Barbie over here. A cuss word coming out my mouth or Barbie something like so that. Many times. You know, and, and you the same way. I really think that obviously your work. Knows you are like the MVP at your work. Um, they, they have really started to notice how great you are in every aspect. And almost like I remember when you left um, Tiffany's team and Matt brought you over and he had talked to Cody about you. And basically what he said about you was a very unique trait that most people don't have. He basically said, I can throw you something. It doesn't matter if you don't know it or not. Within a day or two, you'll figure it out and be great at it. And that's exactly not, not good for my stress levels. <laughs> but it was good for your paycheck and your promotion levels. Not recommended for my stress levels. <laughs> but it was so true because that's how you're you're wired. And you're like that with everything. Your ability to be like, I want to be the best mother and like push in. And like, you know, some people if they're a great wife, they struggle to be a great mother. Or if they're really bogged down at work, they struggle to be a great wife. None of that bothers you. You have this ability to go be amazing and great at work, to be amazing and great as a wife, to be amazing and great as a mother, and to everything that you put time and effort in to be really great at each one of those things, which is beautiful to watch it's a true blessing for me and inspires me to want to push harder and to do better don't push any harder <laughs> <laughs> <Not too bad. laughs> but, but and you know so people probably watch it or listen like oh yeah he's hyping his wife up no like i'm really blessed i'm really thankful and it does inspire me to 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 do more you know, you'll tell me that I'm always pushing and I'm always doing this and it makes you exhausted to watch how much I do but you do just as much as I do. You probably just make it look more effortlessly. Well, I think it's the same. Like, I feel like I have to do a lot because you don't ever stop. So, like, if I'm sitting down and you've just had a long day and now you're, you know, cutting the grass and edging, I'm like, oh, well, I better get up and go do something. <laughs> so, it's not like I'm driven. It's I feel like we obviously play off of each other in that way because it's like I can't be lazy if he's been doing this all day. <laughs> no, but... Um... I want to move on. I just wanted to say that I think a lot of people, uh, and it's not just a you thing, it's a me thing, it's a Bambino thing, it's an everybody thing. People tend to judge people uh, surface level, and I think that a lot of times, uh, unless someone's around you quite a bit, they don't truly understand who you are, or maybe I think a lot of times in life, we might be someone at 18 or 
25 or 29 and then we grow and evolve and people don't see past that they still see you as the 25 year old no and i don't think people need to understand who you are i mean that's like an intimate thing between you and i like you know me genuinely and i know you genuinely sure people can see sides of me but like i don't feel a need to like tell everybody who i am you know that's just like that's just for intimate yeah so that's why the question was what's one thing that people don't necessarily know about you and i think that um you are extremely intelligent and extremely driven and your growth over the last five years it the amount of growth that I've watched you make in five years some people don't grow that much in their entire life and that's not my opinion that's fact as someone that does life coaching as someone that does fitness coaching as someone that does mentoring with kids as someone that has spent the last decade of their life helping thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people literally people go their entire life and don't progress the much that you have in five the years the potential i just don't think you should leave any potential on the table i think when you realize what's possible you should try to pursue it that's good i like that we we'll make that into a short. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it right there. She just dropped the jewel of the episode on you. Tell them one more time. What was that, baby? I don't know. <laughs> potential on the table. Don't leave it out there. Yes. Don't leave your potential on the table. I think when you realize what's possible, you should pursue it. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's switch it up. Oh, oh, oh we're about, we about to get some turn offs. Don't turn us off over this question. My wife's about to drop some facts on you, though. Watch how smart she is. <laughs> Next question. A big topic in our country the last few years has been the controversy between getting the vaccine and not getting the vaccine. There is a lot of misinformation out there between the facts and fiction. Could you tell us the difference between what it meant to actually get the shot or to not get the shot? Um, I am so over COVID. I'm glad that it is over. It was, it was announced that it was over, right? <laughs> yeah. um, I'm over it. But here's the thing about COVID. Everybody, it's every topic in the world, people focus on what's different, what separates them, right? So it was either you were in the box if you got the shot or you were in the box if you didn't get the shot. And then we were fighting amongst each other. But if you reframe this conversation and think the, the reason that we chose to get the shot was the same, it's just the outcomes were different. We all either chose to get the shot or chose not to get the shot because we believed that it's what was best for ourselves or our families based off of the information that we were provided. So I don't personally believe on shaming people for whatever their decision is. I actually think that we should respect people for what their decision was. The problem is what you said is the information that was out there. Um, there was a lot of suppression of information. Mm -hmm. So people that chose to get the shot, um, they did it based off of the information that was given to them. And so they felt that they made a well-informed decision based off the, of the information provided. And you and I, I feel really blessed because I have been in this kind of holistic functional medicine world for several years now. So we had avenues where we were able to listen to a lot of functional medicine doctors or we had access to clinical trials that was not made public and you can't Google and find. Um, you might be able to now, but um, so I, I feel like the reason to get it or to not get it, it, it doesn't matter. The problem was that there was a suppression of information and sure there was misinformation as well, but the problem is that the full picture wasn't painted. And if you don't have a full picture, you can't make a well-informed opinion. Especially when the people that are pushing the agendas are the people that are creating the vaccines. Like your father, we just spoke about him. He sent me a video that I watched the day before yesterday and you watched a little bit of it with me and it was talking about MSNBC and one of the major money providers behind them is Pfizer. Pfizer yeah. So do you think that MSNBC is going to be telling you all the cautionaries or are they going to be pushing you to take it? So behind the scenes in almost everything in this world, because money drives everything. And if you don't think that money drives everything, you're living under a rock and you're blind. Money drives everything in this world. Now it doesn't have to drive you on a personal level, but anything outside this, 
your personal, if it's business, if it's government, if it's television, if it's anything that's coming at you, is it's coming at you on a money-based level. Money rules the world. Money controls the world. Money and power. So these companies, these drug cartels, excuse me, these pharmaceutical companies that are paying for these politicians' campaigns are paying for these networks' bills that are pushing these agendas and controlling this country. That's where your information is coming from. And information was suppressed for so long and agendas was pushed on us on these false narratives and these false information to get us to fall in line and do what they want us to do. So when you cut on the TV and the TV's one-sided and that's all the information you're getting. You go on social media, it's one-sided and that's all the information you're getting. You're going on Google, it's one-sided, it's all the information you're getting. Until all of a sudden stuff comes out like the Twitter files Elon Musk buys Twitter, releases yeah. the Twitter files, and it is shown in the documents mm -hmm. where the federal government yeah. told them to suppress information from doctors from John Hopkins University, Stanford University, Harvard University, speaking out against the side effects of the COVID vaccine. And Not how even the side effects, just like the CDC numbers and the reporting, the statistics of the efficacy of the shot. And, and how that a healthy person should not take it. The only people with preconditions, whether you had diabetes or you know heart condition, or, yeah. should be the ones that are taking it. Yeah. it. But this information was suppressed and hidden from us, and, and it, it, it created this major divide. And not only our, our country, families were divided over this type of stuff. But that's what happens when you have people, companies, that are so powerful and have so much money that they literally can control the information that is given to you because they control the media outlets, the politicians, and the way that the information is distributed. Yeah. So we talked about the absolute risk reduction. Risk reduction on the shot. Really quick before we finish this topic, can you break that down for people that don't understand? And you could probably elaborate on it a lot better than me. Uh, well, it's you, you can do research on it on your own, but there's two measures in which you can look at the efficacy of a shot. There was relative risk reduction, which is what it's reported on. And relative risk reduction is just taking basically two subsets, two studies, two groups, and comparing it to one another. And then there's absolute risk reduction, which is really relative to public health. How is this effective for me? So the relative risk reduction is what they put out for all vaccines. It wasn't just for COVID. But what a lot of doctors were saying is you need to also put out the absolute risk reduction because people don't care about the effectiveness between these two groups. People care about the effectiveness on how it impacts me. So to do a quick analogy on it, I don't want to go too deep, but you can, you can literally Google absolute risk reduction of the COVID shot and it will give you the same information. If you have two groups and you have 100 people for, that received the COVID shot and 100 people that did not receive the COVID shot. If one person gets COVID in this group and two people gets COVID in this group, for the absolute risk reduction, that's going to be one minus two. It's gonna be one, 1%. right? It's, yes, it's, that is how it's going to impact me because two people got it in this group and one person got it in this so, group. So let me make sure you guys are understanding this. There's 100 in each group. When you put someone in that group with COVID, the group of 100 that got the shot and the group of 100 that did not get the shot. One group got one, another group got two. This is just an analogy. That, that's not an actual one. Yeah, that's yeah. a percentage difference of 1%. Okay. Relative risk reduction takes that number, takes the one and the two, the one from this group and the two from this group, and it divides it into each other to make it 50%. Mm -hmm. So now, if they were to report on these numbers, it would the relative risk reduction, which is given to the public, would say 50%. And the absolute risk reduction is actually 1%. Mm -hmm. And this that, that is the difference. So what they were putting out there was that the um, relative risk reduction for getting the, the COVID vaccine for like the Moderna and all this shot was like 98% effective compared to these two groups. 
But if you look at the absolute risk reduction, it was like 0.8%. It's the trickery. You take the 2% and you flip it upside down and you release the number at say 98%. Because if you release the actual number to society and say that it's a 1% difference, people literally would be like, well, what's the point? But if you flip the numbers upside down and you say it's 98%, you got lines, excuse me, you got lines lined up to get a shot because they're believing what you're telling them that it's a 98%, but it's not. Yeah. So, you know, when you have... I mean, you, you could tell that, right? I mean... It didn't stop the transmission. It didn't stop people from getting it. It did, like it, it, it wasn't effective to the degree that it was said it was. One thing I thought was uh, very suspicious from the very beginning is, you know, how often do you go around and ask people, did you have the flu shot? I've never, <laughs> in 42 years of being alive, ever asked another human being if they had a flu shot. And Except for like going to see my primary care doctor and asking me, hey Larry, do you want to get a flu shot? That's probably the only person that's ever asked me that in my no, life. No, unfortunately, <laughs> like you do get a little bit shamed when you go into the doctor. Because like I, I didn't get the, the COVID shot for the kids. And they'll ask me like, are they going to get the flu? They get their vaccines, but I don't give them the flu shots. Um, and you do get a little bit shamed for like, you know. And, 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 and people are susceptible to that. People will get it just because they don't want to be shamed. You know, and I'm very thankful and blessed that I went with my instincts. You know, we talk about this a lot, that human beings are the only creatures on earth that go against their instincts a lot, and that ends up biting us in the butt. I'm so glad and thankful that I not only went with my instincts, but I did a lot of research, and you did a lot of research, and not just conspiracy theory reason. like no but like really spoke to doctors like really dug in suppressed studies yeah and thank god i have a lot of friends that are doctors as well and that are in the medical field and was able to get hands-on real information one thing that and, and people might be like okay whatever larry but one thing that to me always stood out was how the vaccine for covid was the and i could be wrong on this but it's the only one i know of that it's not the actual covid that they're giving you on other vaccines, if you go get like the TB vaccine or you get the uh, flu vaccine, they're giving you a piece of that strain. Mm -hmm. So you have antibodies built up in your system. Yeah. The COVID vaccine wasn't <laughs> a dose of that strain. It was a synthetic that they made up to mimic it. So you weren't even getting an actual, by definition, vaccine. You were getting a synthetic version of it. To me, that always seemed weird as well. And, you know, people might, and, and someone might come on and challenge me on that, and that's fine. But sometimes in life, you have to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. And I just, there, from talking to doctors and medical people, from doing independent research and studying, from seeing the way that these pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies were pushing these agendas, nothing sat well with me about any of it. And the more I dug in, the more I did research, and the more facts started to come out, I became more and more thankful about our decision. You know, Dr. Fauci was screaming at the top of the, uh, the buildings. And where's he at now? His entire medical career is gone because it proved a lot of the stuff he was saying was completely inaccurate. And he went from being the face of pushing it and speaking on it to now, I don't want to say disgraced, but he's no longer at that network. And he's no it's longer practicing medicine. And it's proven that what he said was not true. Yeah, it's just sad. Yeah. Because people chose to get it based off of the information that they had. And it's not necessarily their fault. They believe that they were well informed. All right. So if there's one thing I would ask you guys to take away from that is, I read this, and I don't know how true this is, but I read a lot. And I read that 95% of people believe the first thing they read. So if you pick up your phone and you read an article on Facebook or you read an article or you hear something on TV, 95% of people believe that first thing that comes to them. Even if two days later you read a report that that was complete falsehood, that first initial report still sticks in people's minds. It's insane. Right? A belief is just a thought you think over and over. You can change your beliefs by changing. All right, so let's move on. And this is a complete flip. What is your favorite thing about being a mom? Oh, that's easy. Um, 
I got her. I don't know that I have just one, but like the, the thing that I find most entertaining is just watching them grow and evolve into their own personalities. Like Brayden, who's six, has like all of a sudden become ultra sarcastic. And like sometimes I have to turn and be like, is he serious? And then he'll like turn around and grin at me. So it's just really cool to see things that they're getting into. Um, I even like to see like he really gets into like the mechanics and like he likes to write comics and Kennedy's really creative. I remember telling her that I was coming on here to do a podcast with you and she was like, how do you feel about it? And I was like, a little stressed out to be honest. <laughs> and she was like, why? And I was like, I don't really want to be on camera. And she was like, I love being on camera. And so it's, of course just, she does. <laughs> it's so fun just to see like them become their own person. But also I feel like it fuels me to take care of people. So like I get like a sense of satisfaction and just being a mom, being a wife, and I probably like mother you a little bit too, just because like yeah. it makes me feel good <laughs> when I take care of people. Um, I could definitely see that dynamic. Kennedy would be the actress and Brayden would be the director. Yeah. He would write the script and direct it and Kennedy would be in front of the camera. And they would be but... arguing the whole time. <laughs> she would be like, I don't, it's not my good side, no. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool to see their little personalities develop. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. All right. So, moving along, I'm going to throw you another curveball. But I think that you'll answer this very well. So, this is the Be The Best You podcast. If you could give one piece of advice to anyone watching or listening that they can help use to become a better versions of, versions of themselves, what would it be? Um, I think it would be kind of what I was saying earlier is that um, kind of envision the highest version of yourself or the best version of yourself like what is possible and just show up as that person every single day so whether it's you know what I envision my relationship to be like what I envision to be as a, as a career woman what I envision to be as a mom like what is that best version of me look like is it spending more time with them is it having a loving relationship and then doing action-based steps to be that person every day. And then also I think you can't change what's going on around you until you change what's going on inside of you. And you have to really be willing to challenge your inner belief system. I think that's where a lot of confliction occurs is that like people aren't willing to turn the finger around and say, what's wrong with me? Well, how can I fix this? Even to the point of like judging other people. I was reading a book the other day by Gabby Bernstein, it's called The Judgment Detox, and she talks about how anytime you go to judge somebody, it says, means absolutely nothing about that person. It, it, just because you say somebody's mean doesn't mean that they are mean, but it is actually saying something about you. How is that triggering you? Is that a wound? Is there some shame there? You know, what, what is going on inside you? And if you're brave enough to face yourself, then I think that you can accomplish anything. There's a really good book out there called The Mountain Is You, and it basically talks about how you are the reason why you aren't living your best life. And if you're willing to confront yourself, then you will be able to you know, be limitless. Yeah, that's very deep and very honest, and a lot of people struggle with that. I think that also some people get to a point where like they think, okay, well, I'm good. I don't have anything to work on. And that should never be the case. You shouldn't stop learning until the day you die. You should always continue to grow and to learn and to become a better version of yourself. And it shouldn't stop. You should never get to a point and think, well, I'm good. Or I've reached a certain level of financial freedom. Or, you know, I have a good relationship. Because just because you've succeeded in an area two or three doesn't mean that you can't do better in other areas. And too many times we always just want to point the finger outwardly and we don't want to point the finger inwardly. You'll tell me sometimes you're too hard on yourself, but that's what allowed me to turn my life completely around. And then not only turn my life completely around, but to help so many other people turn their lives completely around. Is that being hard on myself? Uh, if I hadn't developed this ability to look within and see every time I make a mistake and be hard on myself and make sure that I don't make that mistake again and I continue to push to be better in that area, I wouldn't be who I am today. And I actually think that more people need that ability to see their flaws and see their mistakes. And when they make a mistake, understand like, 
nah, like it ain't cool. Like I'm not giving myself a pass for that. Like I should be better than that. I don't like when I talk to other people and when we're having conversations, I can see that they're only waiting for their turn to talk. That they're not hearing what you're saying. But then when you talk, you want me to hear what you're saying, which is fine because I'll listen to anyone. But like you have to be willing to take in as well. But so many times people's minds are just waiting for their turn to respond instead of actually taking in anything. And uh, I think that those type of people are, have the hardest time looking within and making adjustments. Um, and I would challenge anyone, just trust and believe this, man, that none of us are perfect and we all make mistakes and we can all be better in every aspect of our life. So don't always look outwardly. Look inwardly. No, I think that you. Sh I don't think you should look outwardly. You should look inwardly. I, I don't think you should ever outsource your happiness or your peace. It is always an inside job, and as long as you're looking outwardly, you'll never find complete happiness. You'll nope. never find complete peace. It, it's you just can't. Yeah. You have to. And, and you can't. And you can't grow. And I think that like, obviously, this matters in big situations, but in small situations too, like. It could be I'm not folding my clothes right and I'm pulling my shirt out and it's got wrinkles in it. I'm like, why the hell am I folding my shirt like this? That's stupid. That's a little silly analogy. But it doesn't matter what it is. Like, if you realize you made that mistake, then the next time fold the shirt different. Or if you say something and you realize you hurt someone's feelings, then maybe adjust the way that you speak to that person next time. Or, you know, we talk about relationships and stuff and people that go through multiple relationships and it's always the other person's fault. And I tell, like... I'm really honest with people a lot. And sometimes people really love me for that. And sometimes people really do not like me for that. But, like, you know, I'll tell people straight up. They're telling me about five failed relationships they have. And I'll tell them, bro, you're the problem. Like, yeah. What? And I'm supposed to be their friend. Like, what do you mean? Like, what's the common denominator in all five of these failed relationships? The common denominator is you. Yeah. Right? So if you had five failed relationships, could there be a wild card chance that you just picked five bad apples there could be but then that still says something about you because why are you picking bad apples mm -hmm. uh, so you know just look within self that was a great answer I appreciate you giving that answer um, I got one more question for you it's about that time <laughs> yeah. wrap it up you, you ready for this question yeah what is it like being married to me it is life's greatest journey <laughs> no it is because uh, we have a lot of fun together. And um, if, if you can't tell, we are very different. We are um, opposites in many ways in the aspect where a lot of my weaknesses are your strengths and a lot of your weaknesses are my strengths. Um, and so together we make a really strong duo, but we are the same and I think the core areas. We um, hold the same values. We prioritize our relationship. We prioritize one another. So like the things that keep us grounded are our values, but the things that ultimately you need to be able to grow and to like look within yourself, we are very opposite on and we are very like, we challenge each other quite a bit. Like where you came from in your life, if there was a spectrum, you were here and I was here. And so when we would have conversations sometimes, you would be like, you are the most naive person on planet Earth. And I would be like, you are so jaded. I don't know where you come up with these things. People don't act like that. Um, so I think that we both had to, to come and like meet in the middle and like we've opened our eyes to, to different things. But then because we care so much about one another, we talk about this all the time, that we're really appreciative to have the type of relationship that we have because a lot of people go their whole life without having a connection and a love like we have. And because we have that, when the other one challenges the other one or when the other one says you know something that needs to be improved, as painful and irritating as it might be, we know that ultimately that's something that we have to address because it's out of love. So um, I think it's great. I think it's an adventure. We're best friends. We can spend all day together and be totally fine. Not, 
I don't think you've ever gotten sick of me. <laughs> I haven't gotten sick of you, have you? No. I, they're laughing like, I think oh, I, you know, she only knew. No, because I've been thinking, like, I can never get enough. I just always want more. Yeah, it's really annoying. <laughs> people, people hate to hear that. <laughs> Why are they so happy? <laughs> yeah, people don't like to hear that kind of stuff. Yeah, I told you about a conversation I had yesterday. You always tell me about conversations so. where people talk about like how hard it is not to cheat on your spouse, and I'm like, that is terrible. I know. I, I, <laughs> like even yesterday, when someone was telling me that, like, you know, after the first couple of years, it goes all downhill and stuff, and I'm thinking, like, oh, my, no ball my, and chain. My has been going up, 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 up. I think it has to do with our mindset, though, and like what we were speaking to earlier, like envision what you want and keep striving for it so like we're at a great place and i think it's only going to get better because that's what we want i think a lot of people get into a situation they're like oh that looks good over there though like they're they're it's the, mic- it's the microwave society it's always what's next what's next what's yeah. next what's next but like we're happy where we are we just want to see how far we can take it um i think that one thing that is beautiful about our relationship is, you know, when you really love someone, you care more about the other person than you do about yourself. Yeah. And I think it's blatantly obvious that we both feel that way and that we want to push each other and inspire each other to be better in every way possible. And we both do that. I think the universe, you know, the energy we put out is the energy that we get back. And there's this part of me, I'm getting cold chills right now thinking about it because I dedicated my life. I promised my mother that I would turn my life around. And I promised my mother that once I turned my life around, that I would spend the rest of my life helping other people turn their lives around. And for the last you know, 15 plus years, I have done that, especially the last eight years, really, really hard working to help as many people as possible change their lives to make their lives better and to change their mindsets. And it was crazy that the universe brought me someone that has done that for me more like yeah I changed my life yeah I did these things yeah I became the person that I promised my mother I would be yeah I have spent the time and effort to help other people but it's weird how the universe will bring you the energy you put out it's because the universe brought me someone that has helped do for me what I have done for others because even without us talking about it, I say this, I don't know if you take it in when I say this, you made me such a better man, such a better person, such a better friend, father, business person, because you just inspire me to be a better person and to be great every day. Like I wasn't hard enough on myself as it is. You had to come along and put extra pressure on me. <laughs> no, but I'm very thankful because it's like the universe knew the way that I'm wired and the way that I push everyone else, so then the universe brought someone into my life to do, the, to, totally do, opposite. to do the same for me <laughs> <laughs> and, and to push me and to make me better. And every day I'm just thankful and blessed. And you know, the most beautiful thing in this world is my relationship with you and my love for you. It's the number one thing in my life. And um, you know, I feel thankful and blessed every day. And I wish that everyone else could experience it. And I wish everyone else could have that type of love in their life. And I, you know, if I could give people out there advice that are listening, if you find someone that you love, that you really care about, that's a good person and, and it pushes you to be a better person and, and brings happiness and peace into your life, instead of like keeping your eyes open and keeping your options open or worrying about petty things or looking outwardly instead of inwardly, like look inwardly. Be thankful of that. Stop looking at other things. Start thinking about how you could take those two pieces of steel and sharpen each other and make each other better and stronger and sharper. Uh, Because when you find those things, it's up to you to develop those and make those great. If you get accepted to go to Harvard University, that's a great accomplishment in itself. But that doesn't mean that you have a Harvard degree. It just means you got accepted to go there. You still have to put in work. You still have to go to class. You still have to do homework. You still have to do exams to be able to graduate and get that certificate. Your relationship is the same thing. Just because you find someone awesome and you fall in love doesn't mean you get the happily ever after. You still have to make sacrifices. You still have to put them first. You still have to invest time and energy. 
you still have to have the right mindset and look inwardly and not outwardly. But if you're willing to do those things, there the possibilities are limitless and you can have an amazing relationship. And I think that we both have done that and that's a testament to our love for each other. And, and it's beautiful and I, every day it's almost like a dream and I'm just thankful to be a part of it. I agree, it's <laughs> motivating. Just keep on climbing. <laughs> we keep on pushing. Man, if you guys are, have, have watched or listened to this video today, I hope you enjoyed it. It was a real honor for me to, to get my wife to come on here and, and do this. Um, thank you for coming on and doing this. I know this it was is... extremely stressful, but I'm glad that it's over. I, no. I, I know this isn't where you like to be, but uh, no, she, she did it for me. No, there's a lot of lights in here, too. <laughs> But no, man, if you guys are, are watching and listening, man, please take the time to like, share, subscribe, uh, leave a comment, man. Tell your friends about this podcast. And um, just thank you, man. Don't forget, we are producing a new show that's going to be debuting next month. And it's going to be called Prison Talk with LD. Make sure you check it out. It will be on my YouTube channel. You can find my YouTube channel at Larry Dawson B2BU. Thank you again for checking out another episode of my Be The Best You podcast. Until next time, try until you fly.